Welcome to the Lionfish Tutorials, a series of how-to instructional videos covering collecting and handling, monitoring, and dissection. This segment will cover collecting and handling, including tools and techniques to increase the safety and effectiveness of your removal events. The marine environment is a diverse and changing habitat. Invasive lionfish are a recent threat to our native marine systems, and there is great concern over the impacts they are causing. The good news is that local control through regular removals can be very successful in keeping lionfish numbers down and minimizing their impacts. In this tutorial, we'll talk about diver removal efforts and the tools and techniques that are being used to control lionfish on our local reefs. For divers and snorkelers, there are two primary methods of lionfish removals, nets and spears. Each method has its advantages and disadvantages, and there are many styles to choose from. We'll examine some of the more common types and their uses. Though lionfish are boldly patterned and can be ornate in their fin displays, during prime daylight hours they are most often sheltered and cryptic in nature. When looking for lionfish, search thoroughly and explore overhangs, crevices, and sheltered areas. Lionfish tend to prefer high relief and complex structures, though they can be found in almost any habitat. While there are many types and configurations of collecting equipment, one of the most valuable pieces of gear is a pair of protective gloves to minimize stings. Lionfish have a formidable array of 13 dorsal, two pelvic, and three anal spines that contain a powerful neurotoxin venom. A first priority in any collection effort should be safety, and the use of specially designed puncture-resistant gloves should be a requisite for your lionfish hunt. It's important to note that regular diving gloves, and even those made for protection against knife cuts, are not effective at preventing penetration by the needle-sharp spines. Specially marketed puncture or stick-resistant gloves are highly effective at preventing spine-related injuries. We'll discuss first aid for stings later in this segment. The use of hand nets can be highly successful in areas where lionfish are accessible, where they've not been harassed, where fish may be smaller, where live capture for research is required, or where gear restrictions may be an issue. The two primary types of hand nets include mesh bait nets and clear vinyl collecting nets used by aquarium collectors. Clear vinyl nets are typically wide-mouthed and deep-bodied nets with a strong mesh bottom and are held open by an aluminum frame. These nets are often used by divers but are less suitable for snorkelers due to their drag in the water. These wide-mouthed nets can be highly effective even for large lionfish. However, their success depends on slow, deliberate movements and practice placement and collection techniques. The most effective strategy for collecting lionfish with vinyl nets is to use a pair of nets either by yourself or working with another diver. When a lionfish is first sighted, give the hand signal and both divers should survey the scene. This initial assessment should include determining the possible escape routes of the fish, any environmental concerns such as sensitive corals or sponges, any potential safety issues such as overhead environments, and the location for securing the fish once it is captured. Good communication between divers is essential in determining net placement, movements, and other decisions during the collection. From a few meters away, deploy your nets and ensure that the bodies of the nets are well opened. All net movement should be very slow and deliberate, and you should be constantly monitoring the target lionfish for movements that might indicate its attempt to escape. The priority of the first net is to block the most likely escape route of the fish. Once the first net has been placed, move the other net or nets into place to surround the fish. Remember it's imperative that the nets are moved slowly but deliberately to block the fish if it starts to move toward an escape route or gap between the nets. As the nets come together, the fish will typically swim into one net 
and as it does quickly move the other net behind the fish to trap it between the two nets, effectively sealing off any escape. In some instances, the lionfish may make a quick dart between or around the nets. In these instances, even though the tendency is to try to quickly reach after the fish, the best course of action is to let the fish move, re-establish a comfort zone, and then reposition yourself and the nets for a second collection effort. If the fish disappears into a cave or crevice, avoid poking, prodding, or otherwise attempting to scare the fish out of its hiding spot. Chasing or harassing the fish rarely results in a successful capture and can teach the fish to avoid divers, making future capture attempts more difficult. Following a successful capture, the next step in the process is to move the fish to a suitable area for transfer to a storage device. A sandy or algae-covered bottom is most suitable, and you should take care to avoid contact with sensitive corals, sponges, or other marine life. Numerous storage devices are available on the market. For live captures, one of the preferred storage devices is a clear dry bag. These bags are typically made of heavy gauge clear vinyl. When deploying the dry bag, ensure it is fully opened and all of the remaining air bubbles have been released. Once the bag is ready, place the nets containing the lionfish on the bottom, with the lionfish in the uppermost net. The bottom net can then be removed and placed nearby. The remaining net with the lionfish should be secured so that there are no escape routes underneath the net. Use a gloved hand to slowly collapse the net down on top of the lionfish. As the net is further collapsed, the fish is unable to move and is held in place with the palm of the gloved hand. Next, reposition your hand so that you can firmly grasp the head of the lionfish from the outside of the net. Take care to properly position your hand across the face of the fish from directly in front of its mouth. Placement too high along the back or from above may lead to contact with the first dorsal spine, which can move quite far forward. Once the fish is firmly in your grasp, invert the net so that the body of the fish is now exposed in open water. The buddy in charge of the bag should hold the mouth of the bag wide open as the lionfish is placed into the bag. Remember to ensure that the spines do not contact either diver. All movements during the bagging process should be slow, deliberate, and carefully communicated. The diver holding the fish should extend the arm as far as possible into the bag, while the other diver firmly grasps his wrist. Once both divers are ready, the fish can be released. The fish will typically swim away from the grasp of the diver toward the bottom of the bag. The bag is then rolled over and clipped shut. Successful capture! For subsequent captures, using the same storage bag, multiple fish can be introduced simply by sliding the barrier down the bag to herd the captured fish away from the opening. Large dry bags can hold upward of 30 large lionfish. Once fish are in the bag, they are normally quite docile. However, be careful when working around the bag as spines have been known to penetrate through the heavy vinyl. While large vinyl nets may work well for divers, a snorkeler is typically more restricted in the length of time available to make a capture. Many snorkelers have had great success in using smaller mesh bait nets due to lighter weight and significantly less drag through the water. Use of mesh nets during snorkeling entails many of the same elements as the use of vinyl nets for diving, including planning a strategy and blocking the escape route. However, the movement during capture is much more rapid in nature. Take care once you are on the surface to keep the two nets together to prevent the lionfish from swimming between even the smallest gaps in the nets. Bagging lionfish on the surface can be a tricky affair, and most snorkelers choose to swim their fish to the boat to hand up to their surface support. While netting of live fish may be new to most divers, spearing is more widely known and can be highly effective for lionfish removals. 
Spearing may be faster than netting, especially in areas where lionfish can be difficult to reach or in areas where the population is especially dense. The downsides of spearing are that misses can be somewhat common and lionfish quickly learn to avoid divers. Spearing can also attract top predators and prove to be a safety hazard for divers in areas where predators have become accustomed to taking speared fish. There are many types of spearing devices, including spear guns, Hawaiian slings, pole spears, and numerous lionfish-specific devices. Fortunately for collectors, lionfish are quite bold, allowing a close approach and minimizing the need for large gun-type devices. Two common spear tips are free shaft tips and paralyzer prong tips. Free shaft tips may feature a toggle or simply a barren point. Paralyzer-type prong tips have multiple points to better hold the fish. When using free shaft-type devices, take extreme care as fish are able to move around as well as up and down the length of the spear. Many divers have been stung by lionfish sliding down the spear to the unsuspecting diver's hand. In contrast, a pole spear with a paralyzer tip prevents fish from sliding towards the diver and when multiple prongs are in the fish, prevents the fish from rotating around the spear. Regardless of the type of gear used, the same general spearing techniques are used. Though removal of lionfish may be your primary objective, avoid damaging natural resources at all costs. Spearfishers should assess not only the lionfish and its position relative to successful capture, but also the surrounding habitat, including the area behind the fish, to ensure no other organisms or structures could be impacted. If the fish happens to be in a poor location, slowly and carefully move the spear to reposition the fish into a better location. The desired position of the fish is perpendicular or facing slightly towards the diver. Spearing from an angle behind the fish can result in misses due to the movement of the fish and the fact that the spear is moving the fish away from the diver. With the fish in a proper position, maintain neutral buoyancy or steady yourself with one hand on barren substrate. Then ready your spear for release and move it as closely as possible towards the fish. Aim for the area just behind the bony head and above the pectoral fin. In some cases, you may be able to position the spear almost touching the lionfish. With the spear as close as possible, release the spear and keep the fish pinned to the bottom following successful impalement. Lionfish are hardy fish and are rarely killed during a single spearing event. Moving the fish away from the bottom provides opportunity for the fish to escape. With the fish held fast to the bottom and using the gloved hand, grasp it by the head in similar fashion to that described for net captures. While holding the fish by the head and still on the spear, it can be successfully transferred into the in-water storage device. When using dry bags for storage, the same procedure used for netting applies. Hold the lionfish on the spear until the fish is well into the bag. Then remove the spear from the fish. When the bagger is ready, release the lionfish into the bag and withdraw your hand. An advantage of using dry bags is that they also tend to contain any blood or body parts that could attract predators. Other storage devices commonly used in the region include buckets with scored lids, trap door devices, and specially designed tube devices with one-way funnels allowing fish to be introduced with minimal handling. When using these devices, hold the device securely or place it on the barren bottom to allow a forceful entry. Finally, following a successful dive of lionfish captures, storage on the vessel should be considered. Using a suitable cooler or other device that will securely hold the fish is paramount. When removals are well executed and divers are properly equipped, the risk of envenomation from stings is low. However, in the event of a lionfish sting, it's important to know proper first aid and treatment procedures. The most effective first aid is prevention. 
and the primary rule in lionfish collecting should be safety. Use of puncture-resistant gloves and proper collecting and handling techniques are important safety considerations. In the unlikely event of a sting, proper first aid procedures include safe completion of the dive. If the sting occurs during a dive, the diver should end the dive and make a slow ascent, including a safety stop. Rapid ascent or panic following a sting could lead to injuries much more severe than the sting itself. Once on board the vessel or on shore, the wound should be inspected for any trauma or debris and the affected area immersed in non-scalding hot water. The venom of lionfish is a protein-based neurotoxin and heat is thought to break down the protein base of the venom and relieve the pain associated with the sting. Most symptoms are isolated to pain and swelling at the sting site, though in rare cases other symptoms may occur. If any other symptoms are present, or if soaking in hot water does not relieve the pain, medical treatment is advised. Lionfish collecting can be an effective method of controlling populations and minimizing impacts across local scales. Divers and snorkelers can play a key role in working with governments and researchers to protect native marine life. With these control efforts and evolving tools and technologies, there is hope in buying time and protecting key areas of high importance from lionfish impacts. For more information on lionfish control programs and events, visit the following websites. Safe and happy hunting. Welcome to the Lionfish Tutorials, a series of how-to instructional videos covering collecting and handling, monitoring, and dissection. The marine environment is a diverse and changing habitat. Invasive lionfish are a recent threat to our native marine systems, and there is great concern over the impacts they are causing. The good news is that local control through regular removals can be very successful in keeping lionfish numbers down and minimizing their impacts. Lionfish have been found in all habitat types, from shorelines to depths of over 1,000 feet, preferring structure when it is available. Lionfish are now being documented as one of the most abundant fish on some sites and are reaching densities of over 300 fish per hectare. Lionfish have been documented to consume more than 70 species of fish and many invertebrates. They are gape limited stalking predators and can take prey larger than half their own length. Prey include commercially valuable species like juvenile grouper and snapper, recreationally important species like fairy basslets, seahorses and jawfish among others, and ecologically important species like grazers including parrotfish that help keep algal growth in check and cleaner species that pick parasites and clean wounds to maintain the health of the fish community. Lionfish are capable of significantly impacting the biomass of their fish prey. The good news is that local control can be effective. Through focused regular removal efforts, lionfish densities can be significantly reduced and the native marine populations recovered. While we know that control efforts are having a positive effect on keeping lionfish numbers down, it is important to know how well we are doing and whether or not removal efforts are sufficient to help recover native marine life populations. In addition to ecological successes of our removal efforts, it's also important to maximize efficiency in order to get the most benefit from limited human and financial resources. As we address effectiveness and efficiency, three primary questions come into play. How many lionfish are out there? What impacts are they having? And how successful are we in our current removal strategies? We also need to consider how these answers change over time. The first step in any control program 
should be to assess the situation. It is important to know current line fish densities and distribution to be able to direct removal effort and measure success of removals. Both research and volunteer-based monitoring can provide valuable data to assess lionfish populations and document changes. Volunteer-based programs, such as roving diver surveys, can be used to gather broad-scale information on lionfish locations, as well as relative abundance information on both lionfish and their predators and prey. More detailed assessments, usually undertaken by more highly trained staff or volunteers, consist of transect surveys to determine biomass and size classes of lionfish and their predators and competitors. Reef types can be categorized in many ways depending on the questions being asked. For surveying purposes, they are often separated into continuous reef or patch reef designations. Continuous reefs are typically large and well-connected systems of coral ledge or hard bottom. Surveys on these reef types are most often conducted at the same locations during each visit, so some method of marking survey locations is required. On continuous reef, a marker, often iron rebar, is installed to note the beginning of the survey area. Once the marker is located, a 50 meter transect line is placed parallel to the reef ledge or contour of the reef system. Divers then search on one side of the transect using a slow methodical search pattern, moving 10 meters out away from the line, up a few meters, then back in, repeating the search pattern the length of the transect. When they reach the beginning of the line, they search the other side using the same method, resulting in a 50 meter by 20 meter searched area. Concurrent to this search, if two buddy teams are available, or subsequent if only one team is available, a 20 meter measurement is made perpendicular to the first line and a second 50 meter transect is placed parallel to the first transect tape. Divers search this 50 meter by 20 meter area in the same manner as the first. Patch reefs are typically smaller in size, isolated from other structure and vary in both width and length. Rather than overlaying a 50 meter by 20 meter transect, which may stretch into the sand or grass, patch reefs are surveyed in their entirety. To facilitate accurate and complete surveying of patch reefs, they are typically bisected with the transect line allowing divers to search from the middle of the patch to the outer edge using the same methodical search pattern as continuous reefs. Patches are typically measured once to gather length by width information to allow determination of area searched. Sample data collection templates are provided as an appendix in Invasive Lionfish, a guide to control and management, but in any case should be carefully designed and thought out to standardize data collection among all divers. Key information on sizes of reported organisms as well as information on the dive specifics and environmental conditions will be valuable in documenting results. In addition to lionfish and their predators and competitors, high resolution data on prey communities is valuable in assessing ecological impacts and recovery. Since lionfish consume a wide variety of prey, usually less than 15 centimeters in total length, prey surveys must be detailed and thorough, including even small, obscure, and cryptic individuals. For continuous reef systems, Prey surveys are typically 20 meters long by 2 meters wide, 1 meter on either side of the line, and conducted along the same 50 by 20 meter transects placed for the lionfish searches. Two prey surveys may be conducted along each transect by skipping a 5 meter distance between them.
For Pat Treves, shorter transects may be necessary to allow a robust sample size. Data collection sheets for prey surveys should provide ample space for recording the numerous species encountered and the estimated size of each individual fish. A typical prey transect survey may take up to 20 minutes per 20 meter by 2 meter area. When searching for lionfish, care should be taken to look closely in and around structure as lionfish can often be found resting or hiding during the day. When characterizing benthic structure, one may want to record the location of any lionfish found as well as the relief and complexity of the structure they are inhabiting. Relief would include the height of the structure, while complexity refers to the number and depth of overhangs or crevices. Finally, records of the benthic community can be very valuable in looking at longer term variations in habitat and the potential effects that lionfish may be having on these habitats. A common method of record recording habitat information is the photo quadrat method, which provides archival data and permanent records. Photos should be captured using a standardized frame to ensure the same area is captured during each event. A frame providing a 50 centimeter distance above the substrate and images taken every two meters along the transect lines can be conducted in a short period following other lionfish and prey surveys. Digital images should be taken from directly above the substrate and can be archived for later analysis. Coral point count software is commonly used and freely available. Random points are automatically generated for each image and can be analyzed to determine bottom composition and condition. In order to assess the impacts of lionfish and to be able to determine if removal efforts are having a positive effect on restoring native marine life, we need to assess the direct and indirect impacts of lionfish. This includes not only predation, but also displacement on native fish and the indirect effects on the benthic community. Lionfish dissection can provide valuable information on biology, ecology, and impacts of lionfish and are described in detail in a separate tutorial. When combined with monitoring data, results can provide powerful indications of status and change. A key question relative to monitoring is determining how effective control programs are in reducing lionfish impact. To tease out the effects of control from other factors, monitoring must compare sites where removal efforts or management actions are in effect with other reference areas that are not being acted upon. Care should be taken to consider other influencing factors, such as episodic events and potential removals by those not involved in the study. Finally, to assess change, monitoring plans should consider the longevity of the study and frequently adequately address the questions being asked. A single event is an assessment. Monitoring takes place repeatedly over time and is necessary to address variation. Monitoring programs should be adaptive in nature as scenarios may change over time. Consideration of long-term data management and archiving should also be addressed in a monitoring plan to ensure data integrity In summary, roving and transect surveys can be used to assess lionfish, predators, and competitors. Detailed prey transects are needed to assess direct impacts due to lionfish predation and photo quadrats to determine habitat changes. To assess effect, both treatment and control sites are needed. Welcome to the Lionfish Tutorials, a series of how-to instructional videos covering collecting and handling 
monitoring, and dissection. The marine environment is a diverse and changing habitat. Invasive lionfish are a recent threat to our native marine systems, and there is great concern over the impacts they are causing. The good news is that local control through regular removals can be very successful in keeping lionfish numbers down and minimizing their impact. Okay, so today we're going to go over how to do a very thorough lionfish dissection. Now the first thing to keep in mind when doing these dissections is if the fish has been kept cold on ice, these venomous spines can still sting you. So you need to take extreme caution while handling the fish. I'm just going to point out where these venomous spines are. So on the dorsal side of the fish, we have 13 of these spines. You can see them all right here. They're very, very sharp. Now, if you turn the fish to the belly, they have two pelvic fins, which are right here and right here. And there is one spine at the leading edge of each pelvic fin. So there's one spine right there where I'm holding. And then the second pelvic spine is right there on the other fin. And then also on the belly of the fish, you have the anal fin, and there are three very short spines at the leading edge of the anal fin. So you can barely see them right there. There's three of them. So that makes 18 total venomous spines. So those are the spines that you have to watch out for. These pectoral fins on the side, they're not venomous. The caudal fin, this is not venomous. And then the soft dorsal fin is not venomous as well. So the areas you have to watch out for are the dorsal side, and then those two pelvic spines, and then the three anal spines. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna weigh the fish. Um, but first we wanna blot it dry to get off any excess water, so you just blot it. And then you wanna make sure that your scare is, scale is teared. Then you just place the fish on the scale, making sure that no part of the body is, is touching the table. And we record this in grams, so that's 351 grams. The next external measurement that we're going to take is gait height and gait width. It's so basically how big the mouth is. So we're going to open the mouth as wide as it can go. And then we're going to take this ruler and measure gait height in millimeters. So it's 35, and then gape width. Just 34. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some tissues um, that are gonna be used for some genetic sampling. Um, I'm gonna take three different tissue types. I'm gonna take a sample of, of gill. I'm gonna take some a fin clip and then some muscle tissue. Um, it's very important to make sure that you clean your instruments um, and source isopropyl alcohol um, to make sure that the instruments are not contaminated in between samples. Um, so to get the gills, you just open it up and then cut out a one centimeter uh, sample of it. Take your tweezers. And then for the fin clipping, you can just take it from the pectoral fin here. just cut off another square and there you have a nice sample and then the muscle tissue you can just take it from the flesh right here Now we're going to get some internal uh, measurements, so we need to open the fish up. If you turn it over on the belly, you have the urogenital opening right here. You're just going to stick your scissors in there, and you want to make sure to make a shallow cut, and if you lift up on the skin, you'll ensure that you won't cut anything inside the fish. So you just very carefully just cut right down the middle. 
once you reach the pelvic fins here, you're going to have to cut a little bit deeper to cut through that pelvic girdle. And then once you reach this point, you're going to cut up along the gill arch here by those pectoral fins. And then you can pull this back and you have a really nice look at the inside of this fish here. So I'm going to go over some of the internal anatomy of this lionfish here. Again, we have the gill rakers right here. Now this orange organ right here is the liver. This right here is one of the gonads. This is a female. I'll go over sexing in just a minute. This white organ right here, all along here, that's the swim bladder. They use that to control their buoyancy in the water. This organ right here, that is the stomach. It can actually expand up to 30 times its normal size. All of this white stuff all in here, this is all fat, interstitial fat. And then you can see the intestines in here. And then the other gonad is right here. Okay. <laughs> in order to sex the fish, you need to look at the gonads, um, which often are just lying right on top of the swim bladder. So in this fish, this is just one of the gonads. This is a female, um, and for females, we have four different stages for the gonads um, that can indicate their reproductive stage. Now, this is an F2 female. Um, you can't see individual eggs in there, but the, the ovaries are a cream color, and they are much larger than the F1 stages. Now, F3 is the next stage up, and then you have F4. So this is an F2 individual. Complete gonad staging can be found in the NOAA Technical Memorandum on Lionfish Dissections. This includes information for two male stages and four female stages. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut both of these gonads out and we're going to get a gonad weight. I'm using this analytical scale right here. Okay, pause. So I'm going to cut out this ovary. Good, we're cutting out the ovary here. There's one. I'm just going to flip everything over to get the other. There's the other ovary. And now we're going to weigh it using this analytical scale right here. Turn the scale on. And we want to make sure we tear it. And we're going to get a weight both of these gonads. 14.63 grams. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually remove all of this um, body fat and then take a measurement of that. Um, so all of this white stuff that you see, this is all body fat. So we're going to carefully cut this away. Okay, so now I'm going to measure the fat um, using the volume. So what we have is we have 15 milliliters of water in this graduated cylinder and all you're going to do is just drop the fat in the graduated cylinder and see what the change in the water level is. Okay, so now once you have all the fat in the graduated cylinder, you take a volume reading and right now this is at 19.2. So that means there's 4.2 milliliters of fat in this fish. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at what is in this lionfish's stomach. Um, and we're going to take the stomach out of the body cavity. But first we're going to look 
and the mouth and make sure that there are no prey items protruding out of the esophagus. And it looks clear. Okay, now I'm going to carefully take the stomach out of the body cavity. carefully cutting away and then you want to make the cut as far up as you can and you're just going to cut the stomach right there piece off of this. now we're going to open the stomach up so I'm going to carefully grab the stomach here and then I'm going to make a cut along the length of the stomach, again making sure to keep the cut very shallow so I don't cut any of the stomach contents inside. And just push any prey items out. sort through the prey items very carefully. Okay, it looks like we definitely have two shrimp. And the rest of this is just mush. So when we're classifying the prey items, um, we have five different categories, which indicate how um, digested the prey items are. So a digestion level of one means that the prey item was just eaten, and you can um, identify the prey item down to the species. A level two is it's been digested just a little bit, and you can still identify it to the species. Level three is you can usually identify it down to family. Um, level four is very digested. And then level five is, is what we would call this. It's what we call mush, and you can't identify it at all. So right here we have two shrimp that I would classify as level three. So what we're gonna do with these prey items is we're gonna take a total length in millimeters these two shrimp. So we've got 21 millimeters and 20 millimeters. And then we can actually get a weight for each of these shrimp using our analytical scale. Okay, the first shrimp was 0.12 grams. Second shrimp was 0.13 grams. Then we can actually get a volume for both of those prey items as well, going using the same method that we use to measure the fat. So we have a known volume in the graduated cylinder here, and then we'll just drop each shrimp in. And measure the volume again. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the otoliths, um, which are basically the fish's ear bones, and they are located in the brain cavity. Uh, so we need to um, cut off the head. So the first cut you want to make is in between these horns right here and the first dorsal spine. 
we're just going to make a cut down and sever the spinal cord. Now once, you're, once you've severed the spinal cord, you can actually turn the head face down like that. Cut through. How, now we have the head removed. What we're going to do is we're going to cut out the gills to give us easier access. Okay, so you want to grab the gills like so and then make a cut right here through gill arches. And then now you can simply just pull the gills back. Now this bulb right here, this is the brain cavity. What we're going to do is you're going to take your two fingers and run them along either side of that brain cavity. So what you want to do is you want to take your two fingers and run them along either side of the brain there. We're going to push them all the way forward and then we're going to make a very clean cut right here. This is going to give us access to the brain cavity. So this next cut is very important. I'm just going to cut on this side of my fingers here. I'm just going to saw back and forth very carefully. You don't want to crush down because that will not allow us a clean entry into the brain cavity. So the otoliths are just free floating on either side of the brain. So you want to be very gentle when you're extracting the otoliths out because they can be quite fragile. So what you want to do is you want to turn the tweezers to about a 30 degree angle so you can just grab the otoliths out of the brain cavity. And there's one otolith, and then the other one will just be in the same spot on the other side. There's the other otolith. Mm -hmm.